Goedemorgen, good morning. Um, so welcome to our talk on uh, repeatable, scalable path to production for Java apps on Kubernetes. What a mouthful. Uh, my name is Dieter Hubo. I'm uh, working at VMware Tanzu as a uh, technical pre-sales or like a platform architect. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, David. So I'm David Carvon. I'm, uh, I'm also a, a solution engineer at uh, VMware Tanzu. Uh, before I went into the solution engineering business, I was a Java Spring uh, software architect in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, we we're trying to take you a little bit on a historical journey here. So uh, yeah, this is the starting point we're probably all familiar with. Uh, I'm a bit older, I guess, than most in the, in the, in the hall. Um, so I began my uh, career in uh, huge code bases. Uh, that were uh, they hardly had any tests. <laughs> Skip the slide. Sorry. Somehow. Does that work? I don't think it's. Uh, it's really not nice. skipping on this one. No. Okay. So this is a bit awkward. Mm. Maybe put it on mirroring or. Yeah. Sure. Uh, How does that even work? Sorry about this. <laughs> Why is it not showing the other screen? The other screen seems to be frozen. Display. Well, why don't you try uh, turning it off and on again? Indeed, <laughs> that's always the solution, right? Uh, why the HTML, uh, HTMI cable? I think I turn on the mirroring now, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I think Technical system. problems. <laughs> All right. Much better. Great stuff. I think I might have pushed it with my foot, actually. So <laughs> oh. <laughs> Pepcac user problem. Sorry about that. All right. So. Um, yeah, my uh, the, the code bases I worked in uh, had a bit of the same uh, problems. <laughs> so um, so untestable, huge uh, code bases. We all know um, where we come from in that respect. Uh, also, infrastructure that was meant uh, yeah to separate control uh, from from developers. Uh, um, yeah, people that were. Uh, that were operating our software were, were very uh, focused on not having too much change and uh, keeping the situation stable. Uh, same went for our data, uh, huge storages. Uh, yeah, a totally different time. And I think in most big companies, the, the, the remnants of this are still uh, very visible. Um, and of course, uh, we all know we, we, we found some ways out of this trouble, so we went from uh, siloed working, uh, throwing, uh, throwing our products over the fence and expecting the next stage uh, to do something about it, um, to working together in, uh, in shared teams with, uh, yeah, with uh, shared responsibility. I think we're all uh, so somewhat or way on this journey. Uh, this has been going on for decades now. Um, we've uh, severely cleaned up our act uh, with respect uh, to testing and integrating, uh, CI, at least CI is now the, the, the norm, and I would say in most cases uh, CD is uh, getting better. We automate our test testing, increasingly uh, good work being done and good theory on how to do that. Um, and of course, uh, we've torn apart uh, some of the nastier applications into pieces that are handleable by one team uh, that can get their own release cycles, 
Uh, it doesn't need to be anything micro about it, but at least independence uh, uh, to keep on working and not uh, stop the release process at, uh, at the weakest uh, link. And then containers happened and everyone thought like, oh, this is great, this is the, the missing link. Now we put our microservices in containers and we go into, uh, into deployment heaven. So uh, a lot of options came to, to put these containers uh, on our data centers or on the public clouds. Uh, I can remember I, uh, I had my first uh, Docker Swarm uh, experiences and then I had the same experience once again because the, they changed the implementation and the API on me. Um, loads of other options, Mythos Marathon uh, was of course uh, yeah, a big contender at that time, uh, also marketed as uh, DCOS. Um, Kubernetes came up, uh, supported by, uh, by Google. Um, and heavily promoted by people like uh, Kelsey Haut Hightower, who are really, really good at that kind of thing. Um, uh, recently uh, ran into an installation of HashiCorp Nomad, so supposedly very, very good product. I've, uh, I've not worked with it personally, and from my uh, personal background with, uh, with Pivotal, or our shared background with Pivotal, of course, Cloud Foundry, a bit of an odd one out, not just a container scheduler, but also uh, more of a development platform. And that probably gives away a little about uh, the rest of this talk. Um, but yeah, what to choose, right? Well, when you're as old as I am, <laughs> you can remember probably uh, that there, was, uh, there were competing systems to watch videos. Video cassettes were a sort of DVDs that were a little bit bigger and contained tape. Um, so yeah, different brands came up with different solutions. Uh, one was better than the other, and for Dutch people, there was even a Dutch contender to be the standardized system to bring video to the masses. And ultimately, we know that VHS won. Um, uh, I think the most important point here is that VHS didn't win because it has, per se, because it had uh, superior engineering or superior technical capabilities which I'm not saying Kubernetes doesn't, but um, it's largely political reasons um, that it ultimately became the all-pervasive system. And as you can see, I think, yeah, we can all agree uh, that in container scheduling, uh, Kubernetes has become this system. So uh, developers are flocking to this world because now we are entering uh, a great world in which uh, everything is standardized, everything is easy, uh, everything is small, and everything is fast. So, but yeah, now we're there, uh, we have Kubernetes, um, and it turns out uh, that Kubernetes, yes, it's a great container scheduler, but it's not a platform. Uh, it's just, like Kelsey said, uh, a better starting place. Uh, that needs a lot more work to actually turn into something that we as developers can easily consume as a development platform. So, um, yeah, of course, there's a whole lot of uh, abstraction layers uh, when you're building and running software. Um, yeah, that all basically, uh, yeah, together bring a trade-off of options, right? Where we, where we used to start at the hardware level or maybe at the VM level in the past. And uh, now we have the different options of containers as a service or maybe even a uh, platform as a service or functions as a service. So our firm belief is, I think, that the higher up in the stack you go, um, yeah, the more standardization, the less you have to manage yourself. So the easier it becomes to move fast, to focus on the actual content of our work and not on running or configuring infrastructure. At the same time, going down gives us a lot of reason to customize. Eh? Uh, there's more knobs and, uh, and, and, and dials uh, to tweak. Um, and it also, I think, appeals to our, uh, yeah, for our sensitivities as technicians eh, that we like to tweak stuff. Um, so there's always eh, the seduction of going deeper into the stack and having more under your own control. But uh, I firmly believe that if we uh, get distracted there too long, um, 
yeah, we just uh, lose sight of the actual output of what we have to do, which is the outcomes of what we have to do, which is the features we have to, to, be, uh, to offer uh, to our business or organizations. And Kubernetes, um, although it has a lot of knobs and whistles and, and, and bells, it's uh, not that simple, right? We all uh, know the, uh, the happy go lucky case. In an hour, you can know how to, uh, how to launch a deployment that contains a replica set, that contains a pod, that contains a container. That's not the difficult part, right? But the fun starts with uh, yeah, the part of the iceberg that is under the water. Uh, slowly, other concepts creep in. So, I don't know, horizontal uh, pod out scaler, problems around ingress. Uh, maybe problems around uh, volumes, persistent volumes, storage. Um, yeah, and then the, the fun starts even more, right? You have to run something stateful, or you need a daemon set, and then you get into the weeds of security policies, uh, or even uh, the, 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 underlying, uh, the underlying stuff, like node hardening, or uh, running with GPUs. And uh, yeah, it all becomes rather uh, infrastructural and hands-on. So in this, uh, in this slide you see uh, uh, from a state of Kubernetes report, uh, we asked or organizations what they think of the adoption of Kubernetes and what their challenges are. And you see that uh, in many cases, organizations do have challenge, uh, challenges to embrace this new, uh, what's basically the new IaaS. So it's about yeah, how to keep everything secure now that uh, everyone can spin up any container everywhere. Uh, how to build up the knowledge, how to quickly train whole teams or even whole departments and organizations in uh, some of these skills. Um, yeah, also uh, all kinds of infrastructural things, but I think the knowledge and security aspects are a big part of yeah, why Kubernetes is uh, not so easy to consume for bigger organizations. The, in the interesting one is that security concerns and challenges have increased over a year, um, <laughs> which is be probably because people start realizing that Kubernetes by itself is not that secure and that you have to enforce a lot of policies and uh, extra uh, do extra efforts to, um, to get into a secure state. Yeah. That and, and I think the, the increase in uh, supply chain uh, threats, uh, um, CVEs or even worse things that, uh, that lurk in, in our dependencies and in the different uh, base images uh, that get us more and more uh, into an uncertain state uh, about what we have running in production. So, yeah. Uh, there's quite a learning curve, uh, as stated before, to getting like uh, a deep understanding of Kubernetes, of what is the right way to configure all the technical aspects of our apps. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to create Docker files, uh, make choices there about base images, middleware, um, yeah, about layering of containers to be efficient. We have um, all kinds of uh, yeah, directories full of YAML that, uh, that, that surround our applications and um, describe how exactly it should behave on our new uh, universal uh, IS. And, uh, and of course, uh, there are so many aspects to this uh, where we, have, we can and have to make choices. So this is where uh, Tanzo application uh, platform comes in. Um, yeah, we try to uh, we try to to take away much of this toil and and complication, uh, and 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 speed up development uh, by building a yeah a quick sustainable path to production, and basically smooth out uh, the whole developer experience on Kubernetes and not look at it from the infrastructure up, but look at it from what do developers need. Uh, what do security people need and what do operation people need to run a platform at scale? So, yeah, in order to, to get that done, uh, yeah, we basically need to, uh, we need to take care of all the aspects uh, of the whole path to production, basically from a deer uh, to production. So, uh, the, 
our, 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 our travel starts uh, maybe even at uh, the architect level. Uh, so the idea is to already offer a starting point for, uh, for developers that's already certified. Uh, we all know start.spring.io, I would guess, and uh, other, other framework providers also have their startup uh, pages where you can uh, select your dependencies, uh, start from a known state. Um, so our platform offers the same capability, but then within an organization. And I think that uh, if adopted, um, this could be a game changer, right? This is a way uh, for architecture to really influence, uh, to really influence the way people work, the speed with which people can pick up work, and standardization across organizations. It can improve uh, safety and security uh, enormously by basically uh, giving developers uh, the right tools to do the right thing uh, from the start. So uh, other things. Uh, that we have to consider is when you are starting uh, developing, uh, you don't want a lengthy interaction uh, with your uh, deployment platform. So uh, we meet uh, you as developers um, in your own home, uh, on your IDE, uh, be it VS Code or IntelliJ or any other mainstream uh, IDE, um, yeah, where we integrate with our developer platform so that you Yes, you can run your application locally. Uh, you can very easily uh, and quickly deploy it uh, to the platform, which of course has underlying Kubernetes. Uh, but um, uh, you have continuous insight. Uh, every update you do, change you do, is immediately reflected and redeployed if you want. Uh, you can debug, uh, so you have direct access to your application. So another thing. Uh, which is probably underestimated, um, yeah, it's just the access, how, how easy is it to access documentation um, and uh, yeah, to collaborate uh, with other teams on their APIs. Um, so for that, we have, uh, yeah, we have uh, built like a front door, a development portal uh, that, uh, that uncovers uh, all the public APIs or private within your or public within your organization APIs that you can inspect, uh, that you can consume. Um, you can, uh, yeah, in a centralized way, publish your documentation uh, internally, uh, but also have a dashboard where you can have live insight into your application, uh, look at all aspects of it uh, at runtime. So, and then you have uh, the moment where uh, we've iterated on this code, uh, we've worked on the application, and now we think, yes, it can go into, the, into production, into actual production. And there we have like a path to production for every type of application where you can basically slot in all kinds of different steps that you think are important uh, to, um, to get like a safe and predictable path to production. So, of course, we have the testing and building. Uh, in our case, that will most probably be either Maven or Gradle, um, but also uh, the scanning of, uh, of both code uh, and artifacts that we produce or containers. Um, and then, of course, at some point, uh, we have to de deploy this application and maybe uh, roll it out in a special way, use uh, blue-green deployments or canary deployments and uh, ultimately, it needs to run, it needs uh, scaling, and uh, maybe even other aspects uh, to communicate with other clusters like service meshes. Okay, so this all can run on any Kubernetes. This is nothing to do with VMware. It runs fine on our distribution of Kubernetes, but it runs also fine on AKS, EKS, on your OpenShift if you have it. Uh, we are completely platform neutral. Uh, in that respect, um, yeah. So all of this is underpinned by open source. I think at this point, not everything uh, we did in this platform is open sourced. Uh, but if it's not yet, it will be. Uh, we have gone GA with this in uh, in uh, January, uh, so we're hardly uh, we're uh, we're quickly progressing. 
So at the start of the journey, uh, we've, we've based our uh, development portal on Backstage, which I think uh, probably many of you have heard of. I will go a bit deeper into that later. Um, yeah, uh, any framework or language almost will work on this, uh, on this platform, uh, but as we are the custodians of Spring, probably that will be uh, the first thing that we visit uh, to, uh, to facilitate. Um, so cloud native build packs, I'll go into that a bit deeper. Automated container building, a uh, very important aspect of a smooth uh, path to production. Uh, of course, uh, Kubernetes underlying the whole thing. Um, Envoy uh, used in the routing uh, in Istio or in other ways. And uh, as a runtime, uh, currently we use Knative on top of Kubernetes uh, for most application uh, patterns uh, because that just makes sense, as you will see uh, in a minute. So this is a, uh, an overview of some of the open source uh, components that we curate into this coherent platform, um, and which is basically uh, a, a one-stop shop a sort of a software factory out of the box uh, that you can start using immediately and uh, immediately uh, see results. So uh, Backstage started at uh, Spotify, um, like many software practices and projects. Uh, yeah, um, they are uh, an interesting example, right? They, uh, they, they needed this for their own, uh, for their own internal development. Um, it's turned out to be a really successful uh, framework uh, for development portals and it's grown uh, very fast. Uh, all kinds of open source software uh, plugins uh, to integrate with the relevant systems that you might want to have in your uh, centralized uh, um, console. Um, yeah, we use it uh, and expand it uh, to give you application starters. Uh, not just for Spring and Java apps, for, but for all kinds of uh, different languages and frameworks uh, and all the tools to basically bootstrap the, pro uh, the project. Uh, then you have uh, full insight into uh, integration, continuous integration and deployment uh, of your apps. You have uh, some health metrics on the underlying runtime and you see a lot about the security status of your, uh, of your workloads. And uh, as said before, it's also the starting point where you can interact with the rest of your organization and other teams uh, um, to make sure that you efficiently uh, use all the services. So it starts at a very, very simple place. Uh, instead of, I don't know, 2,000 plus lines of YAML, um, we define a workload where we basically uh, point to, uh, point to uh, a, a repository, uh, in this case GitHub, um, give a name uh, to this workload maybe and point out uh, in the workload type to a specific kind of path to production. We say this is a Java web app. This is the way it should be brought to production. And that's it. You apply this, uh, you apply this uh, configuration and then uh, the platform starts to do its magic. Um, yeah. So uh, at the heart of the whole path to production is an open source project that we uh, that we uh, contributed uh, called Cartographer. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a actually a very lightweight com coordinator of uh, native Kubernetes uh, custom resources or resources. Uh, it's a very light integration layer. Uh, it's not orchestrating, it doesn't have that much knowledge about the, the components that it, uh, that it choreographs, as they say. Uh, basically, it just provides uh, Kubernetes native parts of the pipeline uh, with parameter values, uh, picks up the output of that and pushes it into the next step. Uh, and these pipelines that result from this, yes, of course, we deliver a couple of opinionated uh, pipelines that we think are interesting. Uh, we use components like Flux to pull, uh, to pull your code. Uh, we use components to automatically build containers. We have Gripe as a scanning component. Uh, we use Tecton uh, to deploy. Uh, but you can 
quite easily uh, put in your own opinion about the path to production in a relatively lightweight way. Um, so, um, focusing on some other open source uh, components in this whole system, a uh, big aspect, I could have chosen probably a more up-to-date example of a, of a nasty CVE, in this case it Log was about... Log4j? <laughs> yeah, we could, we could, or <coughs> Spectre, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but in this case uh, it's about a nasty uh, <coughs> CVE in OpenSSL. So this is from an older client uh, of us uh, in a different age, but also then with build packs. So this is about a node application uh, that there's nothing wrong with this specific application. It lives, of course, on the node runtime, uh, on all the components you need to, uh, to, to, to run your app itself. And that, in its turn, lives on, uh, on a base image that contains uh, uh, some form of Linux, and in this case, it's probably some, uh, some Ubuntu um, uh, that relies on OpenSSL. Uh, yeah, and suddenly this one package gets a huge uh, CVE, and now uh, we get into a, a troublesome situation if you have deployed this stuff at scale. Uh, so 500 plus uh, Node.js applications uh, in a container platform, and at a specific date, all of these uh, become tainted by a big uh, CVE. So, if done in the wrong way, um, and it was in uh, certain uh, uh, of our customers, um, yeah, uh, you, you basically have uh, too much variation in the way you get to the end result of running your Node app in a container. There are so many base uh, images out there that you can use. If you don't standardize on one, um, you immediately uh, make the mitigation of these kinds of problems a lot, uh, a lot more difficult. And also, your language runtime, right? Different versions, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, got to these versions as the, uh, uh, in a different way, like uh, a node instance from a package manager or some that was downloaded from some site. Uh, or maybe some base image you got from uh, Docker Hub. Uh, so mitigation time here is, uh, can be quite high. Right? So the way uh, we think it should be done uh, is by reusing the same, the exact same base image and the exact same middleware layer in a container. And then all you need is to just rerun your pipelines and uh, change one thing, rerun the pipelines, build the applications, uh, build the images, and you're done. Right, so this is where cloud native build packs come in. Uh, they're about getting the right balance again between on one side, uh, freedom for developers on the other side, uh, some form of control, uh, maybe by standardization. Uh, yeah, they provide you with a way to be compliant and especially they provide you with a way to keep your system maintainable, although there are thousands of containers running on it. Oh, um, so build packs have been donated uh, to, uh, this or, or have been uh, incubating in the CNCF. Um, this is the, uh, the, the Kubernetes native version of this. Build packs originate at Heroku and Pivotal and are ways to build containers uh, container images in automated ways. So, um, uh, Paketo is the open source project that is the actual home of all these different build packs. They are there for the most, uh, most languages and frameworks uh, I can think of. I had a quick check and I saw there were 172 build packs currently in the Paketo uh, repository uh, covering everything from I don't know, uh, .NET Core, PHP, Python, well, you see the different, uh, the different options. So, and when used at scale in Kubernetes, uh, that's a component called KPEC, you can leverage these build packs um, at scale, and uh, where you, of course, manage uh, the top layer of the container, which is basically the application, uh, but the build pack and the build stack uh, actually manages uh, middleware versions, base OS versions, and in extreme situations, operators can basically patch all 
uh, all running containers that uh, originated made from a certain uh, base image in one go. Uh, and these, these, uh, these versions are curated uh, um, when there are important uh, when there are important CVEs, they are mid immediately updated and new versions are released. So it gives you a standardized um, machine for building containers. So another open source component that we use uh, extensively is Knative. Uh, it's been there for a long time. We've uh, run into it probably at some point or another. Um, yeah, and it's still complicated to, uh, to explain what it is because it tried to be everything at once, right? Um, yeah, but the essential components now uh, are serving and eventing. Knative serving uh, just provides you with a little bit more uh, abstractions that are a little bit more geared towards developers um, that, uh, for instance, give you the concept of revisions in Kubernetes, which is, uh, which is particularly useful if you combine that uh, with routing. Uh, this gives the capability, if you deploy your app and it gets a certain revision, you deploy a new version, um, it gets a new revision, and now you can start shaping the traffic between these revisions. Uh, so you can do uh, the, simple, uh, the simple case, of course, switch over uh, from one instance to another, um, but also the more uh, subtle case of doing the canary deployments uh, lead a certain percentage um, to your new deployment, uh, to your new revision, uh, see how it works, and then gradually bring over more of the traffic, all built in in Kubernetes native concepts. And of course, it, uh, it brings a mechanism for uh, auto-scaling, including scaling to zero, uh, which can be great for uh, function as a service. Uh, Knative is mostly marketed as, um, as a sort of serverless platform on Kubernetes, uh, but there are, m there are much more benefits to it. Uh, if you're huge development infrastructure uh, is running test versions of software um, that are running 99% uh, unused, it's probably a good idea uh, to make them out of scale and free up a lot of infrastructure. So this is a bit of a representation, I would say, especially Knative Serving, it installs in uh, seconds. Uh, it just gives you more development-oriented or deployment-oriented uh, abstractions than the, the native Kubernetes API, which still stays usable. So give it a go, even if you forget about our whole platform. Lastly, uh, eventing um, is more geared towards specific uh, applications, event-driven applications. It brings uh, standardized uh, abstractions for that. It uh, gives you options for uh, synchronous or asynchronous propagation of uh, events through, uh, through applications, uh, of course, that have uh, maybe through uh, Knative service sca uh, serving scale to zero uh, capabilities. Uh, and what is propagated ultimately is a project called Cloud Events. It's an API, it's a version, a standard, uh, where you can, uh, um, in a standardized way, uh, define and recognize events um, uh, subscribe to them. Um, it's an interesting project, give it a look. Uh, and in, in its most simplistic form, an application could look something like this. There is a source, uh, in this case, it's some debug ping source, which is always available for your convenience. Uh, um, it it uh, gives uh, messages to a broker. The broker is an abstraction um, that underlying could be have as implementation maybe Kafka, maybe RabbitMQ, or some in-memory uh, message queue. Uh, but as a developer, you don't really see that, right? It's, an, it's abstracted away. You can change, you can uh, optimize without any uh, impact on your application. You could have uh, Amazon services as a source of your events, like okay. an SNS or SQS, yeah. and then handle those events in a broker. Uh, well, the, the broker can... Uh, bring them in, and then your applications in Kubernetes can uh, process them, for example. So there could be all kinds of sources of events. Um, yeah, you can process events in sequence, in parallel. There are all kinds of patterns. This is actually um, yeah, a bit more spe specialized, but if you're into event-driven uh, systems, I would certainly give it a go. 
And these are some of the open source aspects, uh, uh, projects that we used, just a little bit of them. Um, but I think there are interesting tidbits there. And uh, together they create a very strong platform. I think uh, Dieter, this is the time uh, to this is my put cue. it all to the <laughs> test. <laughs> and, Indeed. Uh, and show us uh, how this looks in practice. Sure. Um, so let's have our first look at uh, the application platform. I have to switch to the screen. Yes, we can see it. So that's perfect. Um, so I kind of styled it a little bit already, the GUI. So the GUI, as uh, David mentioned, is based on Backstage. Let me go to the home page here. Um, it's actually running, uh, if you look at the URL, it's running on an Amazon EKS cluster. So we have a way of deploying the platform in a sort of um, view profile where you publish and um, deploy the platform. There's a bunch of packages that contain all of these open source components that we package together, we configure them together, and you have a way of customizing that when you install it. So you can install it on Kubernetes on a kind of like a view Kubernetes cluster where all of your view components will be. So maybe the API portal, that's another example. Uh, let me bring it up. The API portal is also running on that cluster. And that could be any kind of cluster, right? It could be on-premises on, on an OpenShift or a Tanzu Kubernetes cluster. <coughs> um, we can um, secure all of these frontends using OpenID uh, Connect uh, providers. Um, and this is kind of like the main backstage UI where we can gather all the information about our apps. So um, the developer portal that um, backstage provides allows you to register entities and components. <coughs> so everything that you see here can, is, uh, is definable as code. So that's the big advantage. So let me bring in my catalog or my component information on um, the application that I want to show you, which is my Zen application. It's on GitHub. And you can see it has been added here. Uh, there's a concept of teams where you can access, uh, limit access to, to uh, certain teams to see applications. Other teams can see their applications. And there's a certain um, concept of system and topology. So you can hook components together, indicate where the dependencies lie. So if you have a lot of bunch of uh, components or microservices, that together form one app. You may, may have a front end, you may have a database system. You can define those in code uh, and really um, document the um, architecture of your applications uh, and the interdependencies. So for new developers onboarding here in a new company, for example, they can easily see what kind of systems am I integrating with, what are the APIs of those systems, uh, etc. You can look at the, the source code of an application, if you have certain markdown, you can uh, publish that uh, as tech documentation. Uh, it will generate the markdown as nice, uh, nice HTML here. Um, you can see the interdependencies, uh, which components depend on this one, um, which components does Zen depend on, etc. Uh, and these are all auto-generated and using, uh, using the code. Uh, same thing for the APIs. Um, these, these get published here automatically if you provide the open API or Swagger endpoints. These endpoints could be <coughs> live, running on a live application, or these could be uh, somewhere on GitHub or a Git repository uh, where they get fetched from. And then uh, things that we add on top of the backstage is, of course, uh, show you the runtime resources that are running for all these apps. Uh, so you can already see a couple of um, objects here that are running. Let me filter on the Knative service to see the Zen application. So this is basically a Knative application that we deployed. Um, it has an endpoint called zen.azure.hubo.cloud. So you can already tell that this one is running actually on an Azure AKS cluster. Let me go to the nicely secure HTTPS page. I already styled a little bit with Hello DevOps. That was for yesterday for a demo to a certain uh, to some to people at the boot. Um, but you can see it's running on an AKS node. Uh, I have two pods, so if everyone can go to the URL and just spam a little bit, I should have two replicas running. So you should, should see the pod IP um, switching or changing on you uh, if it's not um, being load balanced too much. <coughs> so if we want to make a change to this application, it's running here. It is a uh, cartographer, cartographer workload. It creates a deliverable on this, on this cluster. 
uh, which translates into a, a, an actual app, which translates into a Knative service. So there's a whole tree here, and if we want to look at that tree uh, from the command line, let me actually show you here uh, if it's big enough. It's at the bottom. So with the Tanzu CLI app workload get zen, it's a mouthful, but we can actually see a lot of stuff here, information about the application. And we can see the name of the workload, the type of the workload, and it's the type of the workload that will determine how this workload get built and deployed and run. Uh, because you might have a lot of Spring Boot applications. You want to run your Spring Boot applications all in the same way. You want standardization. You don't want any snowflakes. Uh, you want really a consistency in the same type of apps. You might have Angular frontends or Python processing backends. Uh, you might have not web applications, but batch applications. You probably want to maybe not build them differently, but maybe you want to run them differently. So you will create a different pipeline or supply chain for those. Um, and basically, you can spew out any type of Kubernetes CRD that you want. I'll show that in a bit. But if we look here, we see it has a name. It's attached to my source code. It's looking at a certain branch. Whenever the code in that branch changes, we'll do that in a bit, uh, it will trigger the, the supply chain. Uh, the supply chain that I'm using here that was selected automatically because of the type of workload is the source test scan to URL um, supply chain. We call it that way because we go from source to testing, to scanning the image, uh, to building it, uh, to building it, to scanning it, and then uh, publishing it uh, on, a, on a run cluster. Um, and you can see there's a lot of um, bits and pieces here that are attached to the workload. So you'll see that we have a git repository slash zen object, which is a flux CD object that looks at the source code and pulls it in when the changes. Um, there's a runnable, which is actually a tecton runnable that can call, uh, that can do any kind of CI process, or it could call an integration with a Jenkins pipeline, or with a GitLab uh, pipeline, or with a GitHub action, right? So if you look at tecton.dev, there's a lot of predefined um, runnables that you can just install and configure. You just need to change the template in the supply chain to actually make that integration. So that works pretty well. Then you'll see the source scanning. So we use Gripe as the default source scanner. It can look at Java, Node.js, Python, NPM, which is Node.js, right? Uh, or the Node.js ecosystem. It scans the source code, it scans the dependencies, and it provides a report and puts all the CV information in our security metadata store. Um, after that, we'll try to build an image. So what we're generating here as a template is a K-native, uh, sorry, a K-pack image, which triggers the build service. So as an input, it gets a jar file, a war file, a zip file, maybe a Python uh, source code, uh, and it starts from a source code and it builds an image. So we use the build packs, which get um, selected automatically, um, and it will build your image. It pushes the image to a registry, uh, in this case, I'm pushing to the Azure Container Registry. Could be, could be anyone, right? Once it's in the registry, the next step gets triggered, and it will actually scan the image, because the, the image needs to be scanned again, because there's an operating system in there, there's a Java runtime in there, or a Python runtime, or Node.js, uh, and it can find additional CVEs. Those CVEs get added to the CVE uh, metadata store, where you can then track all the CVEs of your application. After that, um, we try to like configure how the pod needs to be run. So we actually generate a lot of um, Kubernetes YAML file for deploying and running that application. Um, we use a concept called conventions, and there could be several conventions that get applied um, based on the type of application. So because it's a Spring Boot application, we'll have the regular Java conventions, like how do you typically run a Java application. There are some Kubernetes best practices for that, like the memory setting should be same as the memory limit. Uh, there should not be a CPU limit, for example. Um, there are a certain amount of uh, Java options that you need to pass when you start up, etc., etc. Uh, then we also apply some Spring Boot conventions. Uh, on top of that, um, 
one that comes to mind is we want to open up the actuator endpoints for Spring Boot so that we can actually look at the health of the application. So it, it's very, this, this template or this supply chain is one that we think is a really good one for Spring Boot, but it doesn't stop you from changing it and uh, making changes and making it better for your use case. So it's kind of like batteries included, but swappable. That's how we try to uh, convey it. Yes. So let's actually make a source code change. I'm in here. It's a very simple Java web app with a Postgres database behind it. The Postgres database is also running in Kubernetes. We have a Kubernetes binding on that. So my, maybe let's change it to hello room for at DevOps. 2022, yeah. And maybe if we want to see what a blue-green deployment looks like, let's actually make it uh, green, I think that one is. No typos, okay. And then the interface for the developer is typically Git, right? So we want to add our changes. Update for DevOx 22. And of course, we're going to push straight to the main branch as one does for demos. Um, typically, we'd love to do a pull request, test our stuff. Uh, but we're going to go with our guts here. We're almost running out of time, I guess. Uh, so let's go to our supply chain. So in the platform, there's a concept of workloads, as I said. One of the workloads is Zen. I already applied the workload because I've been running it for quite a while. You can see that three days ago was my last source code change. Uh, if you can read it, the second step, I test my source code. In this case, I'm just doing like a Maven package or just only a Git clone, just for the sake of speed. I'm doing my source code scanning. Source code scanning was also three days ago. You can already see there's a list of CVEs here. A couple of critical ones that are, in my opinion, quite um, harmless. Irrelevant and harmless because it, you can see the information. It's about Postgres 9. Postgres 9 is a little bit behind us already. I think I'm running Postgres 12 or 13. And I saw yesterday that Postgres 15 was released. So we'll have to upgrade that one. The interesting part here is that the image provider, which will build our image, has run 12 hours ago. So 12 hours ago was midnight or 10 in the evening last night. I was not pushing code then. Um, it was actually an update in the operating system. So you can see here, 12 hours ago, the stack got updated. The stack is just our naming of the base operating system, which is Ubuntu. And you can see 14 hours ago, we had an earlier update of the build pack and the stack. So the build pack is probably the Java build pack. So maybe there was a Java patch. I'm using Java 17 already, I think, if all uh, goes well. And um, so that one got built. The important thing is that there was no source code change, but still we got a new image with the patches automatically. Um, if we go to the right, I have to be careful when I scroll because it's a little bit sensitive. Um, the next step is to actually scan your image again, and there's new um, vulnerabilities coming out. You can see the critical one from Spring Core. If you look at the ID, it's from 2016. It's from an old version of Spring uh, Framework 5.3.16. We're well past that. I'm already in Spring uh, 6, uh, Milestone 5, Bleeding Edge. And um, so that one doesn't really apply. What the developer doesn't have access to, but the security person might have access to, is setting up the scan policy. So he can set up, set up the scan policy and actually um, tell the company that if we encounter these kind of CVEs, we should stop the pipeline, this should not go to production. Right? So they have full control on that. I have to go a little bit faster here for the pipeline to take effect. Um, but basically, okay, so the source code changed two minutes ago, the source testing changed as well, so you can see the output of the source testing. It's not really a test because we want to speed things up. So now I guess the source code scanning is running. Yeah, so it is running. 
we're using Gripe uh, as our open source scanning. We can also switch it out and swap it out for SNCC.io or uh, Carbon Black. Uh, those are the other uh, scanning providers that we have. We're going to add much more in following releases. Um, the image building, as I said, we're using the Tanzu build service now because you get all of the updates, you get the support on the operating system, on Java, those kind of things. But this could be just the open source K-Pack that builds the image, if you want. Scanner, same thing. The image scanner is by default Gripe. Could be any of the other ones. Uh, so you see here that the source scanning was complete. We have the results here. We can look at the image. And the image build should now also be running. It was triggered a few seconds ago by the uh, configuration. So that one is running. Uh, it's going to take a couple of seconds to build the image. If we look here, we can probably see it running. Uh, KP build list. There we go. So we can see that this one is building. Um, build logs zen. And I'm realizing that time's up and getting the, the indication here. So you can see that the build is going, it's triggering all the build packs. So the Java build pack, the Spring Boot build pack, the Java runtime, so Bellsoft Liberica build pack. Uh, most of the build packs will be coming from uh, the cache because only our source code changed. So only that layer will be uh, changed. In the meantime, it's still running, but um, if you stick with me, and if everyone goes to the uh, application here on zen.azure.hibu.cloud, um, in a minute or so, we should see the change. Another example here is that we have a pull request system. So in a bit, we'll actually have created a pull request automatically in GitHub. Um, this one has already been done recently, uh, just before the talk, because I saw that we had a patch. So I uh, merged this one, and it got automatically um, run on that uh, run cluster. So because of the thing is taking its time, yeah. yeah, it's still doing the build. So I'm sorry, we're out of time, yeah. but in like a minute, I will approve the pull request, and then you'll see the change popping up, and it should go from blue to green, and uh, the title should have changed to DevOps 2022. So if there are no questions or any questions, let us know. But I